The internet is a blessing and a curse. If you spend too much time online, you might end up believing that you are meant to drink your own urine. I am not making this up. Tons of myths, misconceptions, misinformation. Some of it is from misanthropic, ooh, lots of M's, individuals. But a lot of times it just starts out as a simple misunderstanding, misconception. And before you know it, there are people who have a firm, false, fixed belief, aka a delusion that this is a reality when in fact it couldn't be further from the truth. Truth. There are a lot of hair growth, hair loss myths online that I encounter all the time. And I also encounter many of these in real life. So it's not just a chronically online hair loss issue. We're gonna be tackling some of the more common myths about hair loss and hair growth in today's video. Number one, I have seen a fair amount over the years, people believe that creatine supplementation causes hair loss. It does not. As far as I can tell, this misconception stems from a single study of male rugby players where they were looking at creatine supplementation starting with 25 grams per day for seven days and then switching them over to five grams a day for the following 14 days. This study noted that there was an increase in serum dihydrotestosterone after that initial loading dose of creatine and the dihydrotestosterone remained elevated throughout the study. What is dihydrotestosterone? Well, it's a potent form of testosterone and androgen and it plays a role in miniaturization of the hair follicle and androgenetic alopecia, one of the most common types of hair loss there is out there that affects both men and women. So, so people saw that study and were led to believe that, oh my gosh, this supplement can increase DHT. Therefore, it's going to cause my hair follicles to miniaturize and for me to have more hair loss. Mind you, this study has never been replicated. There are a few issues with this study. First of all, dihydrotestosterone in the serum can be elevated just by exercise. These are rugby players. They're working out. Importantly, the free testosterone was not measured. Dihydrotestosterone is produced from free testosterone. If you take a careful look at this study, you'll note that the individuals in the group getting creatine at baseline before the creatine supplementation started, they had a lower dihydrotestosterone level in comparison to the group that ended up not getting creatine. 23% lower. Keeping these points in mind, the actual increase in dihydrotestosterone wasn't really that impressive, but ended up being statistically significant. Statistically significant, but take into account the differences that you were starting with, mm, not really that impressive. Overall, there have been 12 studies that actually look at the impact of taking creatine on testosterone, dihydrotestosterone. They've looked at doses ranging from 3 grams a day to 25 grams a day over a course of anywhere from 6 days out to 12 weeks. Two studies showed a small, physiologically insignificant increase in testosterone, but the others showed no difference. And five of these studies actually took it upon themselves to measure the free testosterone, which remember is what is converted to dihydrotestosterone, and there was no change with creatine supplements. Supplementation. Recently, we got a study that sought to address, does creatine supplementation cause hair loss? This was a 12-week randomized controlled trial. They looked at 45 resistance-trained male athletes, ranging in age from 18 to 40. They got either creatine 5 grams a day or maltodextrin 5 grams a day as a control. And this study showed no differences in dihydrotestosterone between the two groups. This study also showed no differences in hair counts, hair density, or hair thickness. Now, it's not a perfect study, no study is, but all the research that we have doesn't support this idea that creatine causes hair loss. So no, creatine does not cause hair loss. The second myth that I see a lot is minoxidil, which is a very common hair loss treatment, causes wrinkles and profound skin aging. This is not true. As far as I can tell, this myth stems from someone coming across a study that showed that minoxidil, which is an FDA approved hair loss treatment, either applied topically or off-label, it can be given orally to treat hair loss. Minoxidil decreased TGF beta, the growth factor that leads to fibroblasts uh, producing collagen. People came across that and decided for themselves that, oh my gosh, that meant that minoxidil is going to destroy our collagen, deplete our body collagen, and cause wrinkles and aging. We have zero evidence that that happens. At the level of the follicle with regards to hair loss, a decrease in TGF beta might be very helpful in slowing down and minimizing the hair loss process because it would limit fibrosis, which is scarring type collagen put down around the hair follicle as part of the hair loss process. But to assume that localized effects within the hair follicle translate to widespread loss of collagen. We have been recommending topical minoxidil for various hair loss disorders for decades, and there's zero evidence that it leads to collagen loss, wrinkles. There's no association there. A lot of people start topical minoxidil when they're coming into the age, A, of hair loss, and B, of wrinkle formation. So it might be an observation that people make that's simply guilty by association. 
Association. Now, when it comes to oral minoxidil, likewise, we have no evidence that oral minoxidil causes loss of collagen, accelerates wrinkle formation, or premature aging. Oral minoxidil, however, can cause some fluid retention, which might exacerbate the appearance of dark under eye circles. But if you stop taking minoxidil or adjust the dose to mitigate the fluid retention, the dark circles will improve. Now, the third myth isn't really a myth per se, but rather a bit of a misunderstanding. I see a lot of people using either their prescription topical vitamin A, tretinoin, tazeratine, triferritine, or adapalene, which here is over the counter, or their cosmetic retinol or retinaldehyde in their scalp in an effort to improve hair growth. And I get where they're going here for a few reasons. First of all, topical forms of vitamin A, they do help with cell renewal, and they also help some of them to calm down inflammation. And both of these things are going to be helpful potentially for hair loss. However, there have been no studies looking at topical application of these vitamin A derivatives for hair growth. So whether or not this is actually going to do anything remains to have ever been studied. Why are people doing this in the first place? Well, I think people have come across the study that demonstrated that topical application of tretinoin, a prescription retinoid, allowed for better results with topical minoxidil. This is thought to be due to a couple of reasons. Tretinoin may allow for better penetration of minoxidil drug down into the follicles when applied topically. Second, topical tretinoin seems to improve the levels of the enzyme necessary to convert the drug minoxidil to its active form so that it can actually work. Keep in mind, this is one small study. We haven't really reproduced it at a large scale, so it's pretty premature. Suffice it to say, it doesn't hurt to try, but a lot of people just assume that topical forms of vitamin A are established to be good for hair loss, and they're not. I don't have any concerns with people doing this if they want to try it, but I then get a lot of questions around how to execute this. I can't answer questions about things that we don't do as standard treatments and for which there's no evidence to support doing it. There's not a study out there that really establishes a protocol for how often you need to do this, in what order, does the order even matter? People are just kind of making it up as they go along, which is fine. Again, I don't really see that this is necessarily going to be harmful. I don't believe that it will worsen hair loss, but I don't have any studies to back up doing this or to guide anyone on how to go about doing it. Myth number four is that if you're experiencing hair loss and you're a woman, you should consider taking prenatal vitamins. I don't agree with this blanket recommendation. Prenatal vitamins, important if you're contemplating pregnancy, if you're pregnant, take them at the advice of your treating obstetrician gynecologist. During pregnancy and after delivery, your hair can go through many changes. It grows a lot when you're pregnant and then when you deliver, you're no longer pregnant, the hormones shift around and you get a lot of hair shedding. The other thing that happens in pregnancy and why the prenatal vitamins are an important piece of things is that you are at greater risk for certain deficiencies, especially iron deficiency. It takes a lot of iron to grow a baby and you will have greater iron needs while you're pregnant. Then when you deliver a baby, you lose a lot of iron. A lot of women at baseline have low iron levels because we lose blood once a month for a period of time. Some women have very heavy menstrual periods that lead to a lot of iron loss. And low iron can lead to hair loss. Check out my video all about iron deficiency and hair loss. And the prenatal vitamins may be a game changer for hair loss in that situation and for overall hair health by helping to maintain healthy iron levels. However, for women who are not in this situation to just take prenatal vitamins, it can be a recipe for disaster. First of all, you don't know what you're treating. You don't know what type of hair loss you have. So to just take a supplement is kind of like just throwing anything in the dark and hoping that something sticks. The harm in doing this, however, is that iron supplementation when not necessary, say for example, you don't have iron deficiency and iron has nothing to do with why you're losing hair. To just take prenatal vitamins, now you are taking in iron very much so unnecessarily and that can cause all sorts of health problems. Iron overload is a real thing. Check out my video on warning signs of iron overload and it can lead to constipation. So I don't really like that blanket recommendation or that approach that a lot of people take when it comes to their hair loss, not to mention prenatal vitamins. There is a lot, a lot, a lot of heterogeneity out there. The obstetricians will tell you that a lot of prenatal vitamins aren't even dosed properly to address the needs of the pregnant mother and, you know, postpartum mother. So to just go out and buy one, who knows if you're even getting one that is properly dosed for pregnancy. You would want to choose one that you 
your doctor actually recommends. Myth number five, I've pointed out in various hair loss videos before, but it needs to be repeated. The myth is that if you wanna grow healthy, long hair and get better hair growth, you should stop shampooing your hair. That shampoo is damaging to the hair follicles. This couldn't be further from the truth. Regularly shampooing the scalp can be a game changer for helping to promote healthy hair growth for a few reasons. The oil that your scalp produces sits on the surface of the scalp and on the hair strands. As you go throughout the day, it oxidizes and becomes very inflammatory. That inflammation from that oily residue can contribute to further hair loss. Also, that oily residue on the scalp leads to overgrowth of the malassezia yeast, which is a contributing factor, of course, for dandruff, but scalp inflammation. And as you massage the scalp with the shampoo, it encourages healthy blood flow. It's basically a form of scalp massage. I have a whole video about the benefits of scalp massage for healthy hair growth. You should check that out. The other thing that people might be taken aback by who do not shampoo their scalp regularly is that when we shampoo, it helps to dislodge some of the shedding hairs. Those are telogen hairs. They're hairs that are meant to be shed. It kind of helps to exfoliate and allow those to lift up. If you shampoo your scalp regularly, you get that little bit of encouragement to shed those hairs so a new healthy hair can grow in its place. If you don't shampoo your scalp for several days, well, when you do shampoo, it's going to seem like you are shedding a ton and this can alarm people. Again, it's not true hair loss in the sense that that shedding hair is meant to be shed. It's normal to lose about 100 to 150 hairs a day. But if you don't shampoo your scalp consistently, they kind of get a little trap there in the scalp. They're not being encouraged to come out. And so it can be very unsettling when you see all of that coming out in the drain. Now, some people do not tolerate shampooing their scalp daily. Now, some people do not tolerate shampooing the scalp daily because of their hair type. At least once a week, though, is what you want to be aiming for. Are there any shampoos that can help encourage healthy hair growth? Yes, there are certain active ingredients in shampoos that support the needs of the hair follicle and healthy hair growth. On the end slate, I'm going to put my video all about the best shampoos for healthy hair growth. So check that one out next. But if you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.